morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to worship at Renfrew North this morning. If you're at home, a warm welcome to you and to join with us in our worship this morning. And if you're watching it later on, welcome to you as well. We're all one together in worship of God. And a warm welcome back to uh, John Campbell, a great friend who's going to lead us in worship today. And he's accompanied by his wife, Janie. So we're delighted to have them with us uh, today. I have no further intimations, so John. Thank you, Jack. And good morning, everybody. That was a real mumble. <laughs> but good morning to you. And good morning to those of you who are watching online, as Jack says, whether uh, this morning or, or later on. It's just lovely to be back in, in Renfrew North. So let's uh, begin with the hymn, Tell Out My Soul. Now we come before God in our prayers, let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come before you once again in the name of your Son, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus Christ, you walked among us and demonstrated a love so perfect that all human history will unravel before we will con comprehend its depth, width, and height. Today, in a world with so much deception and mistruth, we praise you for the truth that Jesus embodied in his own self, his ministry, and his sacrificial death on the cross. The truth about you, his Father, and our Father, creator and sustainer of the universe. Thank you too for how you still treat us, as who have often drifted from the way of truth and have accepted second best for ourselves, for our families, and our friends. 
You know the truth about us. You know the truth about our past, our thoughts, our intentions, and yet you still promise to forgive us. And so we seek that forgiveness once again as we endeavor to worship you in spirit and in truth. By that same Spirit, lead us in the righteousness that comes only by knowing Jesus and sharing his way of truth. And now continue to bless us, your needy and contrite followers, as we offer together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we turn to God's Word. Um, there are three short readings. Each of them contains uh, one particular word that uh, I want you to look out for. So, first of all, uh, the reading from uh, Psalm, Psalm 25, and we read from verse 4. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Make them known to me. Teach me to live according to your truth. For you are my God who saves me. I always trust in you. And in the Gospel according to St. John chapter 8. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, If you obey my teaching, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are the descendants of Abraham, they answered, and we have never been anybody's slaves. What do you mean then by saying you will be free? And Jesus said to them, I am telling the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave does not belong to a family permanently, but a son, a son belongs there forever. If the Son sets you free, then you will be really free. And in that famous verse that we looked at last week, and we'll look at next week as well as today, John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word today. And now, as we prepare to hear God's word again preached, we sing or listen or share in Spirit of the Living God. trailer for this Sunday, and I said we would look at two questions. First one, why do I see things the way I do? And in a tolerant society, isn't everyone 
entitled to their own version of the truth. Now, we'll deal with the first question in this half, this first talk. Now, on my desk in the the different vestries that I had in the different churches, I had a blotting pad. The blotting pad was made, was, was used mainly for signing the register at weddings when I used a fountain pen. And I can say that many of the young folk had difficulty in getting the fountain pen to work, but we got there. And then because it was flowing ink, the registrar or the, the sheet had to be, the schedule had to be blotted. So I would turn it over and blot it on the blotting pad. Over the year, the years, the, the blotters became a mass of black, blotchy mirror image signatures. Now, I'm sure MI5 or the FBI might have been able to decipher them. But to me, they just reminded me of the mass of influences upon our lives which make up who we are from the moment of birth, which make us what and who we are today as did the BBC genealogy program, Who Do You Think You Are? The only one I think we watched, Janie and I, was uh, David Tennant. Uh, we didn't bother with the others. We were a bit disappointed. We loved Helen to bits, you know that. But we were a wee bit disappointed that here was Sandy, former moderator of the General Assembly, had achieved so much, member of Renfrew North Church, would you believe it? And yet the BBC paid no interest whatsoever because of Helen's uh, background in Northern Ireland. Who do you think you are? In Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, and that's the very, um, uh, just about the the middle of, of the chapter, Uh, At Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And he followed it up with saying, but who do you say that I am? Now, I've produced a modern version, a digital version, you might say, of the blotting pad to help us each one today answer that question Who do you think you are? So, we'll have a look at that just now. And we'll entitle it with this technical question, which I'll explain, and it's not as difficult as it looks. How you got your worldview? Or, what made you who you are? First of all, can I suggest that we all started out as a blank sheet when we were born. We'll get this right. (laughs) So the first thing that we want to look at is that helps us understand who we are is where you were born. Where were you born? Just don't shout it out, but just say, where were you born? If you were born in Kenya, in Iraq, or China, you would not be the person you are today. You would have a different outlook on just about everything. Mind you, even if it was less further afield, like Orkney or Liverpool, you would still be a different person today from what you are, um, of what you, you might have been. Now, if we overlay on that your family, because from the earliest days, we absorbed so much from our parents and our family, things that shape our life uh, to come. 
Was it a big family? Was it a small family? How was it organized? What were the influences upon you within your family? And if marriage comes along or came along, then that would add into the mix. How many times have you heard the expression, since you married that useless creator, she's never been the same? So family life has a big influence upon us. And then if we add your friends, think of the network of friends that you had over life when you were young, the pals that you hung around with, the lifelong friendships that were established from an early age, these were influential on your life. And then if we add to that your school, what school did you go to? So in your mind, just say to yourself, what school? And I want you to think about the school. Think of the first day you went to school. Did you like it? Were you greeting? <laughs> or more important, was your mammy greeting? What kind of school was it? What like were the teachers? What influence did the teachers have on you? The subject that you studied as you got up to school the sports perhaps that you played, the whole school culture. What an important time as young people to be educated. Give me a child till he is seven years old, said Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, and I will show you the man. An influential aspect of our life, our education, and then, of course, the further education. If you went to college or university, how did that broaden your mind? Not just academically, but in so many other ways. And if you were at university or college, did you become more liberal in your thinking? And did you become more tolerant of other students' lifestyles? And then if we add in books, books that we read can channel our thinking in so many different important directions. From all sorts of things, from, from politics to religion. And you see, the importance of books can never be overstated. And that's why over the centuries, governments have tried to suppress certain publications. And it's also why the printing press that was invented by Gutenberg in the 15th century was viewed with deep concern by the church of its day. Johann Gutenberg produced his first Bible in 1455. Some 48 copies still exist today of the 185 that, that he printed. And the printing of the Bible has had an incredible influence on the world. Oh, sorry, I've, well, you see, I'm, I'm running this and I'm, I'm looking at my screen and I'm seeing different things. Oops. Right, it's there in green. Can you see it in green? Newspapers. Newspapers, my goodness. What's your morning read? Is it the Daily Mail? The Record? The Guardian? Or the Telegraph? I know what my wife reads, but I'm not going to tell you. All right. All of us says it's very big. <laughs> it's very wide. <laughs> and it's not The Guardian. But be clear, each newspaper has its own agenda. They're not neutral. And don't believe the clever slogan of the independent. You remember the slogan when the independent was coming on? It is, are you? That's brilliant, absolutely brilliant marketing. It is, are you? But don't believe it. 
All editorial policy is designed to influence public opinion from which party to vote for to who's to blame for X, Y, or Z. Ah, there we are. The radio and television will never be able to um, fully estimate the influence that television has had over the past 60 odd years. Years ago, it was said that soaps like Coronation Street and EastEnders um, were the modern pulpits, meaning that they shaped public opinion and behavior in a whole range of uh, moral and ethical issues. Now, sadly, the pulpit ceased to be, uh, have the ability to shape public opinion. While the storylines of the soaps today still, it seems to me, continue to portray what is now seen as normal, it's okay and acceptable in a permissible society, in personal relationships and public policy. So the television continues to create a, a, an enormous influence. And, and then, of course, uh, the internet. Well, who can doubt that the internet has been the, the biggest social game changer over the last 20 years. The worry for parents used to be for their kids what they were watching on their television in their bedroom. The TV for kids has largely gone to be replaced by the mobile phone and the tablet. And the worry is that the content of the internet cannot be policed and parents have a very uh, very much a right to be concerned. Social media may have brought many benefits, but its negative aspects leading to, to school bullying, inappropriate messaging, and blackmail has become a total nightmare. Who knows where it's going to go? Ah, the church. Did the church come up? Did it come up? No. The church should be there. It's, sorry? It's an orange. Sorry, it's an orange. But you see, that, that's the point. This, this makes the point that the influences become so mixed up that we, we, we don't really see them. That's the important point. So the church, that's a big, big influence on many people's life. So, what were you brought up? Were you brought up a Presbyterian? Are we brought up an Episcopalian? Or a Methodist? Or a Baptist? Or brethren? Right? Was dancing banned because of the church you went to, along with going to the pictures? Cinemas hadn't been invented, Mrs. Campbell. It was pictures in those days. Drinking? Smoking, playing cards, and gambling. And what about whistling and playing football on a Sunday? Yeah? In some denominations, these things were very, very seriously taken account of. And are you still, because of your background and because of all these things going back for 60 odd years or whatever, are you still a bit uneasy about hanging out the washing on a Sunday? Yeah? <laughs> and do you still feel a wee bit guilty about going for a pub lunch? And final question, has the Calvinism of our Scottish Protestant heritage a lot to answer for? I think it has. And then finally, uh, travel is one of the best ways to broaden the mind if you can afford to go further than doing the water. So if you've been traveling over the years, that has been added into the mix. And if we had time to share, we, we could go on adding influences from our own personal um, backgrounds. But you see how it becomes almost impossible just to read and to, to unravel the various influences that we had 
over our lives, just like the blotting paper it becomes just a kind of mass. But the influences are there uh, nonetheless. That's fine, we can switch that off now. These influences all combine without us realizing it to make us who we are and to inform what is called our world view. And I promised I would explain that briefly. Uh, what I mean by that, our world view, it, it's, it's actually it's, it's a, a well-known technical phrase in certain circles. But what it means is it's what we accept and what we agree about society and the world, usually without thinking. And depending on the culture that you're part of, something will seem normal. Whilst, and that's part of your worldview, whilst to someone in another culture, it might be totally bizarre. Let me give you an example. In some cultures, if you like your neighbor, you ask her over for tea. In other cultures, if you like your neighbor, you eat him. That's true. The atheist worldview is diametrically opposed to the Christian worldview. So what is the Christian worldview? The Christian worldview begins with God as creator and sustainer of the universe and life as we know it. The Christian worldview it has the belief that we are created, created in the image of God for a purpose. That's very important to hear that. And how we act in the world flows from that belief. For example, if we hear of something or other and we instinctively say, that's not right, our worldview is coming into play. That's why you're responding like that. So the Christian worldview influences how we live, the values, with the values that are acquired from our Christian faith, as well as those that have rubbed off from the culture and society of which we're a part. Now let me say, as I finish this part, it's all a thousand times more complicated than that. But I hope you get the basic idea and that it will help you reflect on how you got to where you are today. Giving thanks that because of, or indeed despite, various steps along the way, that today you are in the household of faith. And we give thanks. I'm going to share a hymn called All That I Am, which brings up some of these ideas. Thanks, Rona.
all that I am and all that I will ever be. Last week we looked at the first of Jesus' claims, I am the way, and today we look at the second, I am the truth. It was the Greek philosopher Aeschylus who um, first coined the phrase, in war the first casualty is truth. Other more modern uh, people have claimed that, but it was the Greek philosopher first. And some have applied that. In war, the first casualty is truth. Some have applied that statement, bring it up to date, to the media's handling of the pandemic. But I'm not going to go today to the, uh, go there today. You can make up your own mind. Former President Trump will forever be known for his fake news claims. And there are plenty of fakes going around today from, um, from fake tans to Rolex watches to Burberry scarves. And if you're wearing any of these, don't, don't get upset. And every day we, we receive fake emails and fake phone calls, masquerading as the real thing, masquerading as the truth. They are not true, and many unfortunates have been taken in. The opposite of the truth that Jesus spoke about is a lie, or a terminological inexactitude. And think who coined that. Unfortunately, you've got your mask on so you can't shout out. So I'll tell you, it was Winston Churchill in 1906. A terminological inexactitude as a, a humorous euphemism for a lie. He was been humorous about it. But however you dress it up, a lie is a lie. And it usually gets revealed for what it is because as Abraham Lincoln said, no man has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. When Jesus said he was the truth, what did that mean? Well, when Jesus said, I am the truth, it means first of all that Jesus is who he claimed to be the Son of God. That's the first point. When he said, I am the truth, he's saying, I am the Son of God. I am the Son of God. Not only was he speaking the truth, he is the truth. Now, I know that that claim has been denied by millions across the centuries, but as Christians, we believe it to be the truth. We would certainly not be worshipping him 2,000 years later if it were not the case. Countless men and women throughout Christendom have nailed their colors to the mast. And they would not have done that to follow a fake or a fraud. Now, we could spend the rest of the day examining the evidence of the truth of Jesus we don't have time, so I'll leave that uh, to Philip. But let me say, I'm always taken by that well-known quote of C.S. Lewis. It's, you're probably familiar with it. C.S. Lewis said, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. He goes on, either this man, that's Jesus, either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool 
You can spit at him and you can kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. And he finishes, you must make your choice. We all know the informed choice that Lewis made and the influence he had over many decades through his writings. But then once we accept that Jesus, the truth, is the Son of God, then it follows on from that that he has unique knowledge of each one of us. So Jesus knows the truth about me intimately, he knows the truth about you. He knows the truth about our thoughts, our intentions. He knows the truth about our habits, our concerns, our worries, our hopes, and our secret fears. We cannot hide from the one who is the truth. Forget truth drugs and lie detectors. Jesus knows that we have inherited the fallen nature of humanity described at the beginning of Genesis because it's in our DNA. It's in our DNA, this natural propensity to do our own thing. And Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary was to redeem us and he wants to help us chart our way through this life, and in particular, in these difficult days. The other thing is, when Jesus, as the truth, knows us, he knows also about the lies that we accept about ourselves, that we're not worthy, that we don't really matter, that we're just a cog in the great wheel of fortune. He knows about those feelings that can hold us back from being who we created to be. So the truth is, no matter that we do matter to God, that He has a purpose for us. Do you believe that God has a purpose for your life? No matter what age you are, no matter what your background has been, He still has a purpose for us. So the truth is we matter to God and we can genuinely say that this is God's honest truth. In John 8 that we read earlier, Jesus says the truth will make you free. Sadly for some Christians in some countries holding fast to the truth of the gospel, far from setting them free, lands them in prison, sometimes being tortured for their faith. And even here in Britain, if you hold on to the truth of the gospel, you can be taken to court for speaking out. It's happened on a number of occasions already. As long as it's just your personal opinion, that's okay. Because as far as society is concerned, all religions, if you like, are equal even if they are believed or not believed. Everyone has their own version of the truth. In Acts chapter 5, and I've preached a sermon from this pulpit on this very passage, when the apostles were arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin because they had healed someone in the name of Jesus, they were brought before the Sanhedrin, they were dragged from the jail, and they were warned not publicly to proclaim the name of Jesus. Do not speak about Jesus in public. Did they comply? Not likely. It was a no-brainer. What was the answer they gave? They said, we must obey God rather than men. They might have been prisoners, but the truth, the truth 
had set them free. Thanks be to God. Amen. We receive the offering. Now we pray. Lord of all generosity, as we bring our offerings to you, we thank you again for all the influences for good that have been bestowed upon us, especially those that have drawn us into your family as children of the living God. We thank you for the Christian heritage of our own nation of Scotland but we are sad that it is now bereft of the spiritual life that let it be known as the land of the book. Yet we do not give up, but look to you for a renewal of the proclamation of your truth and for prophetic words of hope from those who speak in your name, those who tell the truth, those who seek peace, and will not be swayed from the truth. God of love and freedom, of hope and joy, we pray for those who long to be free, for those wrongly imprisoned, especially those imprisoned because they stand up for the truth. And we pray for those who are trapped by a lack of self-love and self-belief, who accept the lies that say that they are unworthy and do not matter. Free them from that prison to know that they are loved and valued by the one in whose image they were created. Now, Lord, we pray for those known to us who are overwhelmed just now with the struggle of coping for those who have a diagnosis that just feels like a prison sentence, for those whose health curtails a freedom that they once knew, and we pray for those who wish to be free of the pain of this life, and for those who mourn the passing of one dear to them. Grant to each a measure of freedom of spirit and the peace that only you can give. And finally, Lord, in silence, we name those whose burden of worry, illness, or sorrow lies heavy on our own hearts at this time. And all our prayers are in the name of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Well, friends, we'll, I look forward to being with you next week, and we'll look at the final part of the trilogy, you might say. We've looked at the way, the truth, and we'll look next week at Jesus, who said, I am the life. For our closing praise item, I had to hunt around for it, for it, and I found it in an old youth praise book. It will not be known to some of you, but it just seemed to be the, the right praise item for us to finish our service today. So may God bless you in the week that lies ahead. And in the meantime, let's look at these words and listen to the music of Can It Be True?
If you are able, would you please stand for the benediction? Thank you. Go now with the truth of God in your heart through Jesus. Share the good news of freedom and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those who this day have a special place in your heart, now and always. Please be seated.